I'll introduce myself for this deal that we're going through today. My name is um, Marie Alkid Fiddler. Married name is Fiddler. And <clears throat> I was born here at Greengrass in this community. And I don't know who gave me that name, but the Indian name that was given to me, my Indian name is Wachjawi. And it's my grandma, Maraida's mother. She's the one that gave me the Indian name. And I, they know me by that name as I was growing up. When I was growing up, we lived down here in this little community, it's Alkit family down off the hill. He left the land for all of us to live on. He gave us a share on that land. And as I was growing up, I know my grandfather, Elias Alkid, and his brother, Ernest Turins, his name is. And I have learned a lot from them. When I was small, my grandfather used to comb my hair with a steel comb. My hair must have been long and all tangled up because he used to say, come here, Takoja, he'll say it in Indian. And he'll comb my hair and braid my hair. But I used to remember both of them. I learned a lot. The respect that I have today, I learned from them. I learned from my aunt's mother. She is a brother to Elias. And my mother's dad is uh, one of the family. Samuel Alkid is my grandfather. And We lived on dry meat, as I could remember. We used to have that and coffee. Sometimes we don't have, if we're short on food, my parents, my father, they'll go and uh, look for a rabbit and bring it back and make soup. We have to wait probably any afternoon to eat, maybe one meal a day. There was no cars down here at that time. And when we used to go to church, we go from there to the church. Or if it's New Year's night, if it be evening, carry a lantern to the church. But we walked to church. And there's a lot of things I learned from my grandparents, my grandfather. I remember they used to sit there and hold a, a pipe they smoked with, two runs. He used to sit by the door in my mother's house, and on the floor, and he'll say, Opari, and he'll have that pipe. It was his own personal pipe. They had pipe, and they used to pray with it. And mother, grandfather, Elias, if I could remember right, when I go to his house, because we live little ways, we all live just little ways, all the families. And uh, when they cook or make a big pot of soup, an Indian bread, they put a canvas on the floor. We all sit around her and eat. But they used to have that, they always pray. That's always in her among us. One of Elias's son, Simon Alkid, I learned a lot from him because my grandfather died before I grew up, but Simon was still alive 
and my other grandma, Marita's mother, she was still alive, so I learned a lot from them. They taught me a lot. To have respect, to go to church, they used to tell me every day, don't do this, don't do that, that's wrong, and have respect for yourself. And that was a respect that I have as I was growing up because they used to tell me that every day. Don't do this, don't do that, go to church. They always say, watch you all the time, and that's praying. And as I was told that we had that pipe, they always tell me that we can't talk about that pipe because it was a holy thing. It was like a Bible, they told me. So don't just go and talk about it because we pray with that, that pipe that uh, we ha it came in our generation. generation. And uh, they always tell me that to have respect for that. So all these years that as I was growing up, I knew the pipe, and I know where it's at, but yet I have that respect and keep that pipe as a holy thing. They always say, just don't talk about it, and you don't go around and do this and that with the pipe. You don't go and talk to anybody over this pipe and stuff, because it's like a Bible to us to the family, it was like a Bible. And this is what I was told in, in Indian language, in our language. I grew up to know, I didn't hardly talk English. I don't know how to talk that good when I left from this <coughs> reservation. All I knew was Indian words, because I grew up with the real Indian words and everything was Indian. Nobody talked English in my home at that time. And uh, one day back in 1942, I think it was, it was a hard time. My parents told me that during that time in 42, they, they opened that pipe and they prayed with it because it was really a hard time. There's no food on a reservation. Everything was drying up. So they prayed on a West End over here somewhere. And at that time, they said there's about eight chiefs came from different reservations to pray with that pipe. My mother was there. My aunt was there at the time. They seen the pipe when it was open. But uh, like I say, you know, never talk about it. So that's what we know in our family, but we don't go and tell to other people or anything because we have that respect for that. But that's what they taught us. They used to tell me that all the time. In 1942, after that, one day my parents, a truck came. We used to have to go to store in wagons from here, Eagle Butte, to buy food, get ration once a month. Nice to ride in by on that wagon or ride horseback. My parents will go put up hay in summertime all over this community. And one day back in 1942, a truck came and looked for families to go and work, leave from this reservation. Not only my family, but my other families around the relatives all got their stuff together, tents, what not, took us to Belfouche, and we live in tent over there just to work because it was hard times. I had to be out there in the fields with my mother, my aunt and them, picking potatoes, cut sugar beets. Day after day, the lines were like mile and a half, two miles long, and we had to be out there. And I, I learned to work because my parents having a hard time. We all have to work to eat and have food and clothes or shoes. Then from there, we went on to Rapid City, a place called Oshkosh Indian Camp. 
We lived there in tent years and years after that, just in tent through the winter. But my parents were, my parents, my relatives around me were all strongly believe so they go to church. We go to church all the time. And they always tell me we have to pray when you, before you eat. These are the things that they, they taught me. And we live in tents, I don't know how many years, maybe 10 years, maybe more than that, I don't know. But we live like that in a place called Oshkosh Street in Rapid City, Black Hills. And I used to remember in the evenings, I used to have to walk probably half a mile, maybe a mile, I don't know how far. <coughs> but I used to go with my parents. We used to take blankets, put wood in there, carry it in our backs to bring it back to keep a fire going at night in that tent. But we made it, and my parents got a job. They were all working. And as I was young, I had to um, try to work in cafes with my parents, wash them big old pans. Finally, the boss came and said, you're not even old enough to wash these pans. You're too young. You can't handle it. So they let me go. So I stay home with my sister. I watch her when my parents go to work. And. They work in cafes. I remember my stepfather, he's from Fort Yates. He's a uh, dance, ch um, uh, he's a grass dancer. He likes to go to powwow, so I used to take him as I was growing up. Finally, when we lived in tent, finally it got to where maybe we, I don't know how long we live in tent there, but maybe 10 years or maybe more. I can't remember the exact year that finally I got to own a car back in 1953. My parents bought me a car and I didn't know how to drive, but I did it my own self. I used to watch my grandfather because he's the only one that had a car in the whole family. We finally got to that, and finally we live in little tiny two-room shacks. So our tents were gone and getting a little model then, living in two-room shacks, and that's where we lived. I started working. I worked in the hospital for I don't know how long. And I worked in the laundry part at St. John's Hospital for many years there. Charge up food, like get our food once a month. My parents were still working. So finally, my dad, my stepfather was a dancer, so I used to take him around. That time, they don't get paid when they dance. It was just all traditional thing for everyone. So they have gathering for that. And just go to Pine Ridge, Fort Yates, different places. But today I like to see the, you know, younger kids to have that respect as we have as we were growing up. It came from our families. It came from our great-grandfathers. A great-grandfather, they had, they took care of that pipe. And that's the family I came from. And sometimes I sit here and I think about it when I look down off the hill because the land that he left for us has my name on her today that I own part of that land down there. But the rattle that he had prayed with, one day they told me that 
and I was brought back. I read it in a paper, in a Rapid City paper. I didn't know about it. So I said, well, that rattle is a personal thing. It's a, it belonged to my grandpa. So we asked for it back, and we had a meeting at Culture Center. They gave it back to us. And I looked at it, and it's, it was uh, something that he used to pray with. And my aunt told me that they said they believe their ways. They really believe in traditional ways of praying and different things. And there must be a strong people at the time that my aunt, one of my grandmas got sick. And here he said he called a, a medicine man from Rosebud. When that medicine man came, they, they went and prayed. They prayed down here. They got everything ready. They prayed, and uh, they took my aunt in there. And and here, um, this medicine man that came, I don't know what they used, but he said he went and got a hair from her head because she had bad split headaches. And that was taken care of, and here she was all right after that. So then that time, at that time that the real medicine men are strong, they can heal people, they can do these things. And I came from that family, and I just want to really I'm just so glad about it because I came from that family and what I learned, what I've been taught, trying to pass it on to my kids. I have three kids and uh, I have a daughter who lives in Virginia. I always teach her a lot of things and she had that respect what I taught her. And today I have a granddaughter that graduated over there, never smoked never drink, never go out with, don't even have a boyfriend, but she finished her 12th grade and she's going into college. Well, that's part of me that's out there, that doing it, it came from me. I used, I had her and raised her younger child as I used to teach her what, what they taught me, what my grandparents taught me. Trying to pass this on to my grandkids. I have seven grandkids, seven, eight grandkids, nine grandkids. And uh, I always tell them this is what I learned and this is what I know. So I want my grandkids to know these things. They're young yet, and I want them to live the way I'm living, too. That's part of my culture and part of my <coughs> beliefs is a pipe I was taught not to have, to really have respect for the pipe. So there's different ways of having respect for that pipe. They always tell me these things, and I want my grandparent kids to know all this, what my grandparents told me. My aunt, I learned a lot from my aunt that's sitting here because my mother I died many years ago. My mother's dad, he died. All of them are gone, my family. And so just my aunt here, I, have, I always get a lot of things from her, a lot of wisdom from her. One day I wanted to learn how to make star quilts. She taught me how to make star quilts. But the most important thing she taught me how to, what to do today is my, like my families were all 
kind of work in church and became a Christian and part of that that went along with our traditional is what we grew up with to have that all to be working that way I guess and I used to remember with my grandparents a long time ago when we used to walk to church when we lived down here. I remember that uh, Memorial Day, they used to make their own homemade memorial flowers with the crepe papers, then real thin ones, and they'd get a wire or get a hanger and put them together and make flowers out of that. And that's what we take to to our graveyards to think of our loved ones on Memorial Day. And things I didn't know, but my parents told me, my mother told me that at the church, the surrounding area and the community, they camp out there in tents before Christmas. It'd be cold and ice cold, but they'll have, they put up their tent and they stay at meeting hall and they pray and New Year's night, they stay till New Year's night. So when the New Year's night, New Year's Eve come, they play some kind of games. And I used to remember they never buy the Christmas tree. They go out and get it way out there somewhere. So and when I go to church, I used to remember there's nothing but bull Durham will be hanging on there, on the Christmas tree, years ago. And uh, you don't your but they always have this um, Christmas and New Year's. That's now. what the people do long time ago. They go and camp out there and do all this. But there is so many things that today I always think, I always wish maybe the parents could ta tell these to their kids, you know, like we were told every day or they get us all together and they pray to us or something in Indian all the time. And maybe some one, and then we, as the years go by, and I'm 63 years old today, and I sit here, here I am, I'm talking, and I still think of my elderlies and my parents, my great grandma. They always have the Indian bread ready for you if you play outside, and they'll have a soup ready for you when you come in. Mostly riding horseback and all this. But we were told a lot of things. So we have a uh, one day I was looking at pictures, and I have a picture of of my grandpa, Elias Elkid, and them. There's a lady standing behind there holding the map was Margaret Wanbull from Little Eagle, up that way. And another one sitting down below was uh, Gray Eagle, I think his name is. It's easy. Then two rounds in Elias, the picture. Then I seen some more where they dressed to go out and have a ceremony. 
my aunt had that picture. And uh, another one that was taken down there in front of a teepee. It was a little teepee with where they're going to have a ceremony. And my, <coughs> and my mother told me that when my my gran my grandpa Samuel when he when he was in deathbed when he was in deathbed that um Elias said bring the map out. We had the original map. They brought it with that pipe. And he told the family to get that out and they put it all along that wall, all along it. And then my my grandpa was laying there ready to go. He was ready to go in the spirit world and they prayed with him and they prayed with that this map, I guess they hung it out and it was big and it said they hung it on the wall where where he was laying down there. And one time I remember as I was I was when I lived down there with my parents. I remember one of them. I don't know. I was asking my aunt today here. See, I was born in '36. I don't know how old I was, but one of them died, and I remember they. He was laying on a bench. They put. See, at that time they don't bomb the bodies, and uh, they had a white cloth over her mouth to close her the mouth part and the white cloth over the head. I always remember that and they put the feet together and the white cloth down here tied together. So I was just asking her, which one is which one is that laying there? Because I remember that but I was just too young. I don't know which one the family it is. If it's two rounds or my Elias or one of them, I don't know which one. But uh, they don't embalm people that time, so that's how the Indian people, that's what they do when they die. They have to put their mouth, close their mouth with a cloth and tie it around her and the legs. Different things. But they always teach us this. My grandfather used to say, my grandfather used to say, uh, when you have something, if somebody come to your home, offer them a coffee. And if, if they come and visit you during your meal time, share, and if, if it's not enough, share yours with them. That's, that's, they always tell me that. And they always say, have respect, offer them a, a place to sit. Don't forget these things. They, they used to tell me all that. There's so much things I remember as I was growing up with my parents. My grandfather used to tell me, he used to say, don't drink, don't do this, don't do that. Your grandpa and them taught us these things. We learned these. But that share and respect is always in our family. My generation, I don't know how the younger generation is today, but sometimes I always like to tell it to the younger kids <laughs> what I tell my ki uh, grandkids and different ones all the time. So my my great Great grandfather, red hair, I guess. Have um, one of them signed them treaties. Alkid. 
he's in on that. Now let's look at the papers and I have today I think about him like you can you remember your elderlies and these are the things they did before our time. I Uh, only thing that uh, grandfather I remember him saying not not Elias but one of my 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 grandfather's brothers Simon Elkett used to tell me that they were into like long time ago how the Indians were just camp here and camp there and but they always pray with that pipe that's the main thing they have and what they pray for it always come for them and far as I know this is what they told me and I don't know too much about it beyond that I don't know but these are the things that they say. But when <clears throat> They always tell us that we should always, the Indian people should always be together and pray with that pipe because near future there ain't going to be no Indians left. They used to tell me that all the time too. But I don't, I always wonder what they meant by that. And after I got to realize, I think it's uh, the younger kids losing their respect and I think this is where it it's in at. So I don't know. There's a lot of things they tell me but they always tell us that we have to have respect for our pipe that's when we have in our family coming generation to generation for the Alkid family the red hair our grandfather had that took care of it for many years and they always they always tell me about it all the time and and um, that map we had that map that came with it. One of his sons, Simon Elk, had had it when we lived in Rapid City. It was in a trunk. And a beaded costume that was in there. I don't know. After he died, I was looking for it. I couldn't find it, but I think it might have burned up in a house that they used to live in. It was an attic. But they always tell us that we should have respect for elderly and what they tell you, listen and do what they <coughs> excuse me. Teach us. They always teach us to have that respect and honor one another. <coughs> the map that was brought down with a pipe. I think it burned up though because I remember when Elias' son Simon they had that map in a big old trunk took it from here and took it to Rapid. Huh? Winter count map that brought it with the pipe. That's what that was all about. 
I used to uh, remember my grandparents when they lived down here. We all lived down there, little tiny houses. We all lived close together like this, where they pray and they go down a river and get medicine. And I remember when I get sick, I have a cold one time. They they killed a skunk, and they made grease out of that, and that's what they put on my chest, my neck right here, and that was the medicine we had to take. If I have an earache, <laughs> they smoke <laughs> bull durham or whatever, and they put that smoke in our ear, and they said, "Well, that will that will go away," you know. And which it did. And so there's a lot of things that our grandparents know. And so they had um, different <clears throat> medicines like that they get, you know, from the river. And they use it for if you get hurt or if you have a cut or whatever, these things. But nobody knows that today because we don't really know what what it looks like. Nobody knows that today. And I, <clears throat> my aunt was telling me that uh, one of the horses had a. Uh, a joint pulled out on the front leg, and here they said my grandfather, Elias Alkid, said he took a dime and he put it in here, in the shoulder, and they put some kind of a, um, <laughs> what do you call it? Uh, <clears throat> tobacco like anyway and they put it on her said that horse that shoulder all healed so things like that they did at that time that you know these are the things that we know we can't do it today because <laughs> it probably won't even work for us you know but these are they were traditional people they believe they have their beliefs so they can heal people and do these things and they can spit, you know, it happens for them. But uh, that's what they were, they told me one time down there. So, but today, <clears throat> if we can all believe what our Indian people used to believe in many, many years ago. There won't be any heartaches today or anything like that. We'll go on reservations. But a lot of us don't know that, so that's going on all over today. People shedding tears for their kids and different things because these things were never taught in the family to grow up with, <clears throat> like we were taught. There's a lot of things that they taught us what to do and what, what not. But mostly we're all Indians. Said in Indian all the time. You grow up with it, and you know how to talk Indian. So I guess <clears throat> my great-grandfather, Red Hair, had that pipe many years and generations, supposed to come to Elias and on down to keep that, our traditional thing, and but it didn't happen that way. His half-sister or somebody, well, he was on deathbed, they came and got that pipe 
but he didn't want to say anything. He didn't want to fight over it. Or don't just see he's he had that respect. So pride person and just had that. <clears throat> what kind of person he is? He didn't want to fight over that pipe or anything. So that's why it went to Martha. But um, uh, it's supposed to come into Alkid generation. But that's where it end up to, but <clears throat> our grandfathers, they have a lot of respect for that. They always tell us not to even talk about it. We're supposed to keep that holy, as we all know, because that's our belief in that. So today my beliefs are have respect for that pipe. Still have a lot of respect for that. And I respect my elderlies that are older than me. And I would just really wish that I could say thank you to them, you know, what I learned today to them. But they are not here. Only one here is my aunt. And she's 80 years old. Somewhere, somehow, someplace along the line that younger kids have to know these, what they taught us and what we learned. There are oldest one is um, G uh, Gideon, but he died. Philip Alkid is the oldest one. Oh, second to the oldest. There's Philip. Huh? And then Nancy Alkid, Larrabee. And then my mother's dad is Samuel Alkid. Then the fifth one is uh, Simon. Simon Alkid. The sixth one is Annie Yellowhawk, youngest one. Well, not the youngest, but there's another one. Her name is Muriel. Muriel. She died when she was 18 years old. So there's five of them. Were, they're all dead. They're all deceased now. So those are the, <clears throat> the family itself that come from Elias and Red Hair family. I mean, generations ahead man on the family coming down. So that part there and <clears throat> so back in nine I don't know what year uh, Elias became of a deacon in our church and uh, what year? Nineteen oh six he was a deacon in our when the Christianity came. Mm. 
So out of that, from our family, there are one was a red cherry ribbon yellow hawk, and my sister was a missionary worker from that family, Birdie Red Horse. Okay. My name is Shirley Eagletail Fiddler, and I'm a descendant from Alkid Redhair, Hihachapa Tehinsha. I am a sixth generation to him but by bloodline. The Alkid family are the direct lineal descendants to Alkid Redhair. And I'm going to read off his history, his histories in museums. Smithsonian and also Vermilion Museum and also Pier Museum. Alkid Redhair was a who took part. Um, he was a head chief of the Sands Ark Band, and he took part in a Little Big Horn battle in eight, um, June 25th, 1876. And um, before he took part in a little big horn battle, before the, they were attacked, they had a, uh, a Sundance Rachel start it early mid June 1876 to prepare all the warriors and, and stuff to, to what was ahead to come to them. The Sundance Rachel had started and ended June 14th, 1876. The Chinupa was brought out for prayers. Alkid Redhair was the, the keeper of the pipe, pipe bundle. He opened a pipe bundle up for prayers, along with other pipes. He was among all the bands that, that three mile long, Along the river, there was over 15,000 teepees, and his, he had over 500 warriors. Two of his sons, Nupa Ianke, Ernest, later known as Ernest Turans, was a young warrior at age 16 years old. His brother had a buck elk later known as Elias Alkid, was also a young warrior at age 15 years old. When the battle, when they were attacked June 25th, after the battle, after the battle took place and they defeated George Armstrong Custer, all the bands had gotten together, the Teton Sioux, went up the, traveled up the mountains and they held their victory dance. Later on, after holding their victory dance of defeating the battle that took place, later on they went and separated in different area or different, they departed from each other. In 1876, Alkid read here, who surrendered to the Calvary Post at Fort Sully Calvary Post, along with his 500 warriors. He was not allowed to have rations because of he was hostile, considered to the War Department. During, his, during the time, he was put in the Calvary Post along with the many Kojos, the, the head had um, one of the many Kojos helped, helped him with rations given to him and his warriors. He survived during, at that time. He was later released. He was re later released after being held as prisoner. He later, he later went and took part in a ghost dance and what started a new 
a new religion among the Teton Sioux known as Lakotas in 1890. The ghost dance was to was to bring was held prayers because of what had happened, trying to save their land and their loved ones and their horses and buffalo was taken all away from them. Their belief and and losing all their fa um, family members from 1883 to 1898. Starvation among the each one because of rations for their the families. <clears throat> Hardly any rations because of what took place at Little Bighorn Battle. Our kid Red here is a descendant and have have family also in the big um Bigfoot band that was massacred in nineteen oh eighteen ninety December twenty ninth and also to Sitting Bull, a relative to Sitting Bull. He was interviewed by Edward Curtis in 1907. He taught his sons, Elias and Turons, how to hold ceremonies and ghost dance and also sun dances. He was still doing the ghost dance, his belief in his culture, as all they all had believed. When they killed their leader, Sitting Bull, after his death, each of them all prayed. They, they took part in that ceremony's dance. He was one of, among one of them that did this, the ghost dance. After the battle took place when he was a prisoner, a rattle, a wagmuha, was taken from him. Over a hundred some years, this rattle was kept in the, in the museum, historic, in pure South Dakota. Alkid Red Hair had two sons that had three sons. Nupa Ianka, er, later known as Ernest Two Runs, Elias, Alkid, both brothers growing up and raised by their father. Alkid Red here was a keeper of the Chanupa, the white buffalo calf pipe, also known as Petrin Hinchala. Petrin Hinchala, you know how to spell it? Petrin Hinchala. Our kid Red Hair was only the third keeper to the pipe, brought down from generation to generation when it was first brought to the Sons Ark tribe. He was kept from father to son. And his grandfather, Wosla Naji, Buffalo stands upward. He had left a traditional law to the Chanupa. It is also known also that nothing but good feeling prevails, lives on forever in the Sanzart tribe, and that whenever any member has been found guilty of committing any wrong, that member has been cast out and not allowed to mingle with the other members of the tribe. That was a law for the Chanupa, kept from his grandfather and he kept that in his tradition, traditional law also as a keeper. <coughs> Elkid read here before he became chief of the Sans Art tribe ban. He was a great, great, greatest warrior. He had two names, 
Hihahapa Pihinsha, head leader in his warrior society, charging into battles, being the first to count cope of his enemies, was the highest honor a warrior could attain. attain. A warrior was, was entitled to wear an eagle tail feather upright in his hair. The greatest warriors were quite well known and they're recognized among their tribe and people. They were usually wear one or two eagle feathers. Special ceremonies and celebrations, they would wear their war bonnets with trains of, trains of feathers that trailed to their heels. Earning their eagle feathers, they were later to become a chief. In 1800s to to at that time, each warrior had to earn all their eagle feathers, who later all of them become a chief. They had to earn it. And Elias Alkid, a son, was chosen by his father as the, the next keeper of the Chanupa. There, there was a drought in 1934, and it's in history of treaty books and also museum. A drought on all the reservations. And Elias had, had gotten eight reservations together to come and pray, and he had opened a pipe bundle up for prayers. He was taught from his father El Kid Red Hair. He was chosen from his father also as a keeper of the Chanupa. This was history left by by El Kid Red Hair, which the El Kid family are the direct lineal descendants, and he also left history of himself in museums and pictures for his family members. And Edward Curtis interviewed him also in 1907. And that was now today, the book is published and it's Edward S. Curtis, Great Plains. And this was him. The Alkid family have the real picture to this. So he left this. And the writing down here on this side, that's Elias's history. See, they got both Elkins <laughs> in two different witch cult there. That was my grandfather. I was raised here in Greengrass growing up. I went to school here. We rode horses. We lived here using lamps. And in an odd house, <laughs> and going to school in a bus, and um, in dorms, we all had to stay in the dorms from each community. I grew up in the dorms, and on weekends, every Friday, the the children or whenever they they get checked out, they come back home to the communities. And later on, it, a school bus came after us, which we all grew up here in Greengrass community. We were, our, I was told of the, the Chanupa at age eight years old from my mother and grandmother, Hannah Alkid, Red Horse, and my grandma, Mary Ida, Mary Ida Larby. Her mother is Nancy Alkid. And this was the history of, of what happened. To this day, the Alkids are the original keepers of the Chanupa that was kept from three generations. Alkid was only the third keeper of the pipe bundle. There was things that was kept in a family member's Elkid Red Hair deceased December 1914.
Elkid Red Hair Deceased, December 1914. And I always think a lot about him when I see his pictures because he took care of his, his tribe, his tribal people and his band concerning a chief of all of them. And I'm glad that he took care of all his people when the Little Big Horn battle when they were attacked by the United States. He has descendants from the Bigfoot. Also, so his youngest sister was killed at a young age. He told in a history of his youngest sister being killed, but he didn't write down how or from what it, but then at that time they their enemies and was crows and stuff they had to try to survive of trying to save their land of the great Sioux Nation. Today is now is a, called a South Dakota. <laughs> but they were fighting for their land their land that they once owned. So he was, he's remembered by all of us, a history that he left, Elias, his children also, and, we're, and I am coming from William and Elias and Alkid Red here. I am only a sixth generation to him. And I'm speaking on behalf of the Alkid family, my grandma Marida, Larrabee, her mother, uh, Nancy Larby, raised my grandma, Hannah, and Joshua, who was also remembered, two children of William Samuel Alkid. So this is a thing I always remember. I did a history for all of them. I had gotten they had gotten their family tree from Aberdeen area, also Shine River Realty here, which we had, they had proven they are the direct lineal descendant to him. Today, everything is Martha, bad warrior, but they never mention him. He's the main one that's in the museums, and he's the one that should be in the showcase. His picture is up on a culture center with this one among the ch all the chiefs. He's sta sitting there with all the other chiefs. He's a chief of the Sands Art Tribe, Pan. And proof of him of history that he left in museums we have sitting here with me. And um, also of all the chiefs that should be recognized among the Shine River, each lineal descendant has to have proof in which we are, we do have the proof of him. And here's his right here. So it's a history from all our grandfathers. Sitting Bull, I'm coming from Sitting Bull, and on my father, Fred Eagle Tell, he's a descendant from John Grass also. So I'm a descendant from both Al Kidd and, and John Grass. My father is from Rosebud, Rosebud Sioux member. And here is a picture of the the winter count map that was kept, how the pipe first came to the Sands Art tribe. Wosla Naji was Al Kid Red here's grandfather. And Elias is in this picture. Red hair Al Kid Red here is son. Elias Al Kid and his brother Ernest Two Runs. This winter count map was kept from generation to generation. And the Al Kid family have have today, when how it was taken and brought to the people. He had drawn the pictures of it, of how the pipe, 
how the pipe first came and that was kept with the Chanupa also. And Margaret Wanbu, a descendant to Sidinbu, is here on this, on my right hand side. And Clarence Gray Eagle, he was born in 1874. He is also a relative, uh, a nephew to Sidinbu, and Grandpa Elias is at the end right here, and Grandpa Two runs. So it's a history of how we're all close related. <laughs> And, I'll, and that's how this history for Al Kid Red here, and everything was kept like this in the Al Kid family. And I think that's all. And that the Wagmuha, the rattle, was kept in a museum over a hundred some years. The rattle was incorrectly given to someone, but later was give, handed over to the Alkid family, the direct lineal descendants, which the Alkid family have today, kept from Alkid Red here. That was his rattle that he used in ceremonies. All chiefs were allowed to have a rattle for ceremonies. They also have a bag a bag. Each chief was allowed to have a beaded bag also. So this is a lot of things that the people have to understand. If you're coming directly from a chief, you know, you have to have a lot of respect to earn that, to become a chief. And he did. He earned all his feathers. Pilamaya, Shirley Eagle Tail Fiddler, Greengrass. My name is uh, Leonard Fiddler, and I'm from uh, Greengrass, or Eagle Butte. And I was born and raised here on the Shine River Reservation. And my mother is from the Shine River Reservation. And my father is from Canada. His name was Joe Fiddler. And I better back up a little. My mother's maiden name was Lizzie Worthingham. And she was also born here on the Shine River Reservation. How we got the Fiddler name, we come from four chiefs, direct descendant of four chiefs here on this reservation. Is uh, Sitting Bull and Chief Forbear. And we're close related uh, to a lot of people on the Standing Rock Reservation that my parents never did really tell us all of them, but uh, the Grindstone family on the Standing Rock Reservation. My grandmother was, Louise Thompson was one. And I don't know Mrs. Grindstone's first name, but I know it's, we all used to call her Grandma Grindstone. Medicine woman. Medicine woman, I guess. And I was born here on this reservation, and my father has never told us. He came into this reservation as an orphan from Canada to the Pier Orphanage as a baby. And uh, I guess he's Chippewa, Norwegian, I don't know what all. But he didn't tell us about any of his relatives because he was a young child when he came in. 
we're just now, I'm 64 years old, and I'm just now finding out some of my relatives in California, they're all from Belcourt, North Dakota. So as far as my grandfather and grandmother on my father's side, I, I don't know too much about it, but, but our mother has told us here on this reservation about the, the story of the peace pipe that was brought to the Indian people here. Uh, a lot of people think that we aren't Indians because we have the fiddler name, you know. But we are uh, descendants of Sitting Bull and uh, uh, Chief Forbear. Flies over the road. Flies over the road. 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 World. World. Who's, who's the next one? Well, that's enough. Anyway. anyway, yeah. They told us about, uh, like I was saying, the respect <coughs> and. My mother always told us, you know, respect yourself first and then respect your elderly people, you know. Uh, and that success was out there, we had to work for it. And then they told us about uh, being Indian a long time ago. The Indian people had respect for each other. They went and visited each other and, and helped each other out. If somebody was sick in the family, or well, the community or the relatives around, they would cook up some soup and fry bread and wojapi, and they'd take it over to this home where this person's sick, and they would eat with with uh, with that sick person, you know. Then also when there was death in the community, well, the community would wait for any social gatherings in that community till after the burial of the deceased. And she come and told us the story of the, of the peace pipe, the white cap pipe, or how it was brought here and how the Elkhead family was the caretakers of this pipe. Like I said before, there was two, I heard different stories, but I've heard it from my elderly people that they say there was two chiefs went out hunting Some of them say they was looking for their horses. I don't know which is the right one, but then they seen this object coming from far off. And as that, as it appeared closer, well, it was a beautiful woman that had this pipe in her arms. I guess. So she told these two chiefs not to be afraid that she brought something for the Indian people. She told these two chiefs to go back to their camp and prepare a place that she was bringing this pipe to the Indian people. So in the meantime, this one chief, he had evil thoughts of this beautiful lady. And he tried to grab her. And, uh, cloud come down from above and just burnt him all up and this was just a cloud of smoke after it cleared up he was laying there in his bones I guess. So the other chief went back to his people and told him to prepare a place that this lady was bringing this pipe to them. So this chief got back to his people and they built a teepee and they bedded it down with 
sage. The people all gathered there, I guess, and she brought that pipe to the teepee. And apparently, from what I hear, she told uh, the Indian people there that she brought that for them, that pipe for them to pray with. In time of war, in time of starvation, or any other need that they had with the tribes. And as I've heard, they say that when she was ready to leave, she left and turned into four different colors of a buffalo. But the last scene, I guess uh, the four colors represent the four different tribes, uh, nationality of, of uh, the people, I guess. And when she went over the hill, she was last seen as a white buffalo cat. So this is what I gather from the Alcott family. Not only the Alcott family, I've seen pictures that they had and of the map that was supposed to come with the peace pipe. My wife has that picture with her right today. Well, I really don't have uh, much more to say is that uh, um, Talk about your grandfather. Oh, yeah, I have a, another grandfather. His name, uh, he was a scout and a chief. His name was Justin Eaglefeather. And I was very young, but he also had a war bonnet that drug clear to the ground, you know, in the back. And, uh, well, at a young age, I didn't know what, what that was really for. I thought it was just for them to be dancing Indian. I didn't know the meaning of an eagle feather and how they earned them eagle feathers, you know, to be able to wear that headdress like that. Uh, right today, there's an elderly man in La Plante. His name is Grover Scott, and he was telling me that I should get a tape recorder and tape Grover Scott, because he knows a lot about my grandfather, Justin Eaglefeather. He said, there's nobody knows, and uh, I should take a tablet and write down all what he tells me, you know. But that was, like I say, now, I guess his wife is my grandmother too, but I don't know, that we used to just call her Grandma Eagle Feather, you know. But I don't know her names, you know. So a lot of things that I never was told about uh, relatives like this till just lately when all this been coming up about who, where, where is your descendant, where do you come from, and stuff like that. Well, I didn't even know until Shirley been kind of checking the history and stuff. And We used to go over to my grandfather in Little Eagle. His name was Bill Thompson. And he lived in a little log house there. And he was from Montana. And he used to tan hide and make ropes, hay ropes. He used to sit there and teach us how to do them things. Then my grandmother, Louise Thompson, she taught my sisters how to make beef jerky and pound cherries. 
she used to take them swimming down the river and she would just sit in the middle of the water washing her clothes. And she also taught them how to dry corn, make wasnan, how to dig turnips. She walked with a uh, blanket on her back and carried wood from the river and stuff. Them little cherry trees, she said that, that you could really make good bread with that because it throwed a lot of heat. My grandfather, Jim Thompson, used to ride horseback. He had a old white horse. He used to ride into Lilligo after groceries. I can remember he'd bring me a sack of candy back all the time. I used to meet him almost halfway. But one time, Lilligo from here, how many miles do you think it is over there to Lilligo? My grandmother was in her 70s. She rode that white horse from Lilligo down to our place down here at White Horse. We often wondered how she come through that, all them gates between here and there. But she didn't straddle that horse, she kind of sat sideways on that horse. And that really surprised my mother and well, the whole family that she rode down her horseback. And then, huh? Well, it's Eagle Feather's name, isn't it? Well, I don't know. Anyway, that's about all I got to say. I, I, that's all I was told, and I learned, you know, what they told us, you know. Well, the Indian people a long time ago were survivors, you know. They are talking about this U or Y, 2K or whatever. I said, well, it wouldn't bother us Indians because we lived at lamps and without lamps and we lived off of the, the land. My dad was a trapper. We ate a lot of beaver, so a lot of hides and stuff like that, rabbits, pheasants. Do you remember some of the early stories they might have taught you? Well, see, my, uh, I wasn't, uh, we will just go to Little Eagle to visit uh, uh, our grandpa over there, but my grandfather from my, my dad's side, I never did meet, you know, like they're, uh, like I said, my father come in here as an orphan. And today, I met two guys up there in a garrison, uh, Montana, that they're 70 years old and they're my first cousins. Never knew it. And uh, like family like that, that I'm running into, you know, and we have family, Minneapolis, uh, that's my first cousin, he's a prosecutor there, and I never did meet him, but he just give us a call, you know, wanted to meet us, you know. He said he knew that he had family over here, but never took time to come out here to the reservation, you know. Maybe you could tell us about your knowing um, Chief Fool's Crow. He meant a lot to a lot of people. Yeah. Uh, Chief Fool's Crow, I've uh, met him, and um, I've talked with him, and he told me a lot of things about the uh, Indian culture, and which I wanted to learn about, the meaning of different things how they, they were supposed to prepare for a, a sun dance. And uh, he told me that before you sun dance, you're supposed to, four years, you're supposed to get ready to sun dance. You just can't go, if they're going to have a sun dance, you just can't go over there and say you're going to dance. You have to prepare your body and soul 
because that's a very sacred thing that you're doing when you're committing yourself to a sun dance. He also told me that when you do them things, you have to be humble and show respect not only to the elderly people, but to the young people and teach the young people our cultures that will carry on in this world. Because that's one of our cultures, I guess, we'll never lose by our generation to generation uh, handed down to teach our younger people what this is all about. I think uh, like our Lakota language, we're losing that already. And I think that it's time that somebody, I guess it's up to us, to teach our young people our Indian heritage and our language. Because we'll never have no culture if we don't have our language. We need communication between the elderly and our future generations. To, te to teach them what it really means to be a Lakota, a true Lakota person. They also told me that the flesh offering that they take from people at a Sundance as a sacrifice for someone that they love and their family. For sickness or hardships, any hardships that they have in a family, that's why this one person sun dances for the sacrificing his self, his body, for the people that he loves. And he also told me that as being a chief and holy man, medicine man, that people today don't show the respect that was shown years ago. He also told me a lot of other things that I, 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 I don't, can't remember. But I just kind of took the important parts of what he've told me and I've experienced what he said is true. He told me that you always had to be honest and faithful to your fellow men and that you'll never go wrong. And always put prayer first in your home and anything you get, even in your travels, he said. He also told me that he made 16 trips to the Black Hill, uh, to Washington in behalf of the Black Hills, that it was ours that he fought for. And that's another thing that he told me, that the Black Hill issue should be handed down to the younger generation so they know what's happening with the federal governments. That's about all I can remember. He, he told me a lot of things. I sat with him three days down there in front of that, uh, that Sundance down there, but I was curious and I wanted to know what it was all about, the <coughs> meaning of this, why they did this and stuff, you know? And uh, I guess a long time ago, the Indian people never used to have sun dances. It ain't, it ain't supposed to be commercialized. It ain't supposed to be 
uh, like them uh, tied to the tree and stuff like that. That stuff wasn't supposed to be on television and stuff like that, you know. But as years come by, like I said, modern, modern stuff comes on while uh, they're doing it, you know. And he also told me that a medicine man wasn't supposed to receive any kind of compensation, money, or anything like that when somebody goes to them for ask for help. Prayers are, the medicine man is supposed to give them the right direction, you know. But today he said they just play with stuff like that, you know, they take money to do that. So I guess that's about all I got to say. And I want to thank you people for letting us tell our story about our culture and the meaning of it to us as Sioux people. It's an honor for you guys to come and interview us. What I'd like to say about the young generation today, the children and stuff, I was a chief of police of this reservation and also a city chief of police of Eagle Butte for 16 years off and on. I've worked with five different chairmen on this reservation and I also have worked with the youth and years pass and how the parents had control, more control of their children because they had a right to discipline their children. As years come by, the welfare, I had meetings with the welfare and state social services, how to plan for the future of the, the young youth on this reservation and it come to where the parents had control of their children because they'd be able to spank them and correct them but as years come by this child abuse has come in and then if the parent does discipline his children child, he as much as slaps them on the rear end, I guess you might say, uh, that right away the souls of this child, the children today know that this child abuse is an effect and they threaten their parents. They say, I'm going to go tell the teacher that you abusing me. But when the child does that uh, at the school, the welfare will come in, social services, and they'll question this child, and this child will tell them what happened at home. Next thing you know, you have the police and the social services come down with a warrant to take the child away from the parents, put him in different foster homes, then they take the parents to court for child abuse. Some of them end up in a penitentiary uh, for child abuse, for correcting their children. So now today that change made a big change, not only in Indian country, all over in these schools. Like today, the children has more to say than the parents. They tell the parent what to do and the parent listens to them. When they get out of high school, they buy them a car. They give them money. They never come home at nights. Like before, they had a time to come back. They had a curfew to abide by. 
Today, you don't have that. They go free all night long. And even you go to these towns, them, car, them cars all piled up along the street, along the road, honking horns, and them kids is up all night long. And they start smoking drugs, drinking, and that's why we have all this violence. As being a chief of police of this reservation back in 1978 to now, there's really big changes. I've talked to our tribal council here on the Shine River Reservation. We have gangs here on the reservation today. But our police department know who these people are. They know who the parents of these kids are. I think that they should have the parents liable for the action of their children. And then when I was chief of police, when we have a juvenile underage that's causing violence someplace or being intoxicated or using drugs. We would go pick up that child regardless what time it was, two o'clock, three o'clock in the morning. We wouldn't put him in detention but we'd take him up to the jail and to my office. Then I would call up the parents at that time. I tell them that I have their child in custody, that I would like for them to come up, that I would like to speak to them. When they come up to the jail, I'll tell them that you're responsible for your child, that he's into this trouble, but we're going to release him, release him back to you. If this happens again, you'll be going to court to stand the consequences of what your child is doing. But them things today ain't happening. So therefore, our young generation is way out of control. So I feel as though today that Christianity plays an important part of every human being's life. I feel as though that the parents should take their children to church and let them have spiritual guidance. Guide them and maybe we wouldn't have these problems that we're having today. But we're having a lot of neglect in our parents doing this. So I, I'd say that, you know, another thing that should be done, they should have more recreation for the children, the money they spend on this reservation. You know, they have a swimming pool up here and stuff. Seem like they would be able to arrange to take these people, these children, like on these communities like this, once a week or something to Rapid City. They have this youth center. They have money that could be legally uh, utilized <laughs> to the youth program and the housing, this seven generation thing. But our leadership today isn't doing that. They're looking out for their own self. As long as they get that paycheck, they don't care about the communities and the reservation. So do you have some um, messages <coughs> you'd like to share with today's grandchildren and future generations? Well, like I say, I think that the parents 
should uh, have more control over their kids and know where they're at, you know. But uh, today we also have bingo, you know. There's a great default, I guess you might call it, for our people. You know, they leave their children. You can go to Rapid City. You go to that bingo hall right there, them little kids are outside peeking in the window, waiting for their parents. Now that shouldn't be, you know. Uh, that shows neglect to that child. Uh, they should get a babysitter so they have and know where their child is. I know I wouldn't do that. Uh, I, I couldn't because I'd be worried to death because what happens today, they steal all these kids and, and stuff and uh, I wouldn't want, uh, you know, a lot of people think that that can't happen here, but it can happen anywhere. So the advice I'd give is they should have more control of their kids and know where they're at at all times. They know where that bingo dauber is all the time. Casinos too, yeah. Well, see, that's another thing that, uh, you know, somebody has to be near these youth and let them know that they're loved by somebody. You know, somebody cares for them. They, they think that nobody is around. Yeah, oh, my parents are over here. They left me here and stuff. And I don't have this, you know, like the neighbors and stuff like that. And then that's how they commit suicide. So what needs to be done is they have to put their arms around their children and tell them that they love them, you know, and do something for them, you know. But where they leave them like this on a reservation and just jump in a car and take off and leave them, that's some of the problems of today too. You're making me fill a whole book here. <laughs> <laughs> but if you were speaking to a little grandchild today, what would you tell them? What kind of a message would you give them? Well, I, ones? I tell you, I got I got a little granddaughter. Okay. I just bought her a new bike yesterday. She comes here, we take her to church with us. She sings in church. I tell her to pray all the time. I tell you, you have to let God lead your life because He watches you and you do not steal, you do not take anything that isn't yours. You ask. And if in your, somebody else's house, you have respect for that house. So I could come in here and sit down to the table to eat and she'll say, Grandpa, you forgot to pray. I could be sitting on that chair she comes ready for bed, she'll come over there where I'm at and she'll say, Grandpa, we have to pray. So she remembers that. The other night here, she come to me and wanted me to pray with her. So I put my arm around and I prayed. I said a little different. And she said, Grandpa, that's a different prayer that you said. You know. So <laughs> that's what I tell my grandchildren, you know. So that, that a big part is uh, letting God in your life. I don't care who it is, little or small, you know. I'm, I'm speaking on behalf of Leonard Fiddler and Dowin Fiddler and his brothers and sisters of the history of their mother and their relatives on Standing Rock Reservation. And there was a history lift for them and they have all the history. And in 1700, the Teton Sioux 
Their grandfather was P Chief Puffin Eyes. They executed him in 1700s because of they had to leave from Minnesota. He had 17 sons. Crowfeather was one of the sons. Also, Forebears was one of the sons. Um, Grindstone, and it comes on down to all of them, were all sons to Chief Puffin Eyes. A long time ago, from 16, 17, and 1800s, each chief were allowed to have a lot of wives, which he was one that had a lot of wives. And after his execution, the descendants came from Minnesota into the plains of now known as South Dakota, their, their land at the time. So all of them all stayed together Sitting Bull, his history coming from Sitting Bull and Grindstone and all of them stayed together coming from their grandfather, Four Horns, Chief Four Horns. He named his nephew Sitting Bull as a head, head war chief. And Sitting Bull took care of all his, the ban of the strong, strong hearts, society. Sitting Bull's name was Slow. He was born in 1831, present day, now known as Bullhead, South Dakota. His birthplace was known to the Hunk Papa Sioux as many catchers. During his childhood, his name was Slow. His father's name was Returns Again, a great Sioux warrior. His name meant that he'll always return to fight another day later known as Jumping Bull. Sitting Bull's mother's name is Mixed Day, later known as her Holy Door. His uncle's name is Chief Fourhorns, Chief of the Hunk Papas and Strong Heart Society Warriors. His father returns again, had a dream and a vision, which he received four names, Buffalo God Wakantanka spoke to him. These four names he had chosen, Sitting Bull, Jumping Bull, Bull Standing with Cow, and Lone Bull. The sacred names he received, he gave his son Slow the name Sitting Bull. Returns again took the name Jumping Bull. The other two names, Bull Standing with Cow, he was given to his nephew, later known as Young Joseph White Bull. Cherry Creek, South Dakota. Lone Bull, his nephew, was the other name he gave to his nephew. Sitting Bull was chief of the strong hearts when he, he, his uncle gave him that. All the, the bands had chosen him. His, his uncle, Four Horns, and the Hunk Papa's Warrior Society that the Teton Sioux could be served best by a single head chief. Many Kojos, Sans Arc Band came together to set their camp as of the rest of the bands. They agreed on selecting Sitting Bull as head chief. The Oglala did and show up for the honoring of Sitting Bull. In 1857, during winter, Sitting Bull had lost his wife and small son. Sitting Bull had nine wives which she was one of the, the wives that, was, that died. Sitting, Bull, Sitting Bull's father, June 1857, Sitting Bull was killed, or oh, Jumping Bull, his father, was killed in a crow ambush. Sitting Bull heard that his, the news of his father's death. He had chased after the crows, killing them. He later gave his adopted brother stays back his father's name, Jumping Bull. He then later had also became chief, belonged to the Two Shash Warrior Society. Among the strong hearts of Hunk Papas, there was a lot of warrior societies, and one of the warrior society was the, the, um, the Two Shash Warriors. And <clears throat> Crazy Horse had always been
close with Sitting Bull also. His warrior society was the two Shash warriors. And the um, strong heart warrior was the Midnight Cream warriors. Also the strong hearts. There was a lot of warrior societies in that time. And he took part at Little Bighorn Battle, Sitting Bull, as the years coming. And he had Leonard and Dowan Fiddler and his sisters are descendants coming from from um, six chiefs and one one medicine man and our great grandmother her name is Pijuta Dangwi, medicine woman and her uncle and their grandfather was one of the medicine men his name was Kerry the Kettle his gourd rattle, the Wagmua, is now in a, in a museum right to this day. His niece was medicine woman, Maka Pejuta Dawi, earth medicine woman. They, were, they are descendants coming from him and also the seven chiefs coming from their grand their their mother their mother's name is Lizzie Rollinghan and one of the sons is a spotted horse from uh, Lar Brew so they're coming from a lot of descendants and they have a lot of relatives on Standing Rock of their mother's side Lizzie Rollinghan so it's a history tool for all of them, how they're coming down in history from 1700 to at that time. <coughs> One of his grandfathers is Mathoi Ichila. I don't know how you say it in Washichu, but he was a scout also for, for, the, for the chiefs or the band he went ahead. He went ahead to take care of his people in case of danger was coming to them. He'll warn them ahead by zigzagging, and they'll know that he's in there. They, um, the enemies are getting closer to them. He's in trouble. So these scouts. He was one of the scouts for the, the um, hunk papas and coming from his, that's one of his grandfathers. And coming, there was only five or six family members. Oh. There was only five or six family members after the, the battle, Greasy Grass. There was five members of the family members separated that lived in Whitehorse. White Horse, South Dakota, and the name has gotten was given has gotten its name by Chief White Horse. So these five, six names, his mother was his mother and grandmother Louise fights the bear. Pejuta Dawi had three daughters. Mere looking glass. She's a sister to Sitting Bull. And um, so they're coming down, and the next daughter was um, Fights the Bear, Bernice fight, Fights the Bear. Her name is Pejuta Dangwe. So they came on down like that at, as mere looking glass. Um, Pejuta Dangwe only had one son. And his name is Spotted, Spotted Horse from Lower Brew. He was married, but didn't have children. And he was from Lower Brew. And he's also had um, relatives from there, and Lizzie, Leonard's mother, and his grandmother, Louise Fights the Bear, were the descendants 
coming from him. So it kind of just came down on history of the females and the males. So white horse community, there was only, they were the only ones living in the white horse community. When the, the first five families had moved into the community of white horse, Leonard and Dowan Fiddler and the rest of their brothers and sisters all were born and raised. Today that log house is still sitting and standing on their land. They were all born and bear, uh, born there in that log house until they built uh, their home, a bigger home, and their bigger house had five bedrooms because there was how many? Um, Twelve children, and he cared for all his nieces and nephews, so it was kind of like a big family living in one home. And that's how they were raised on their land until after their their mother and father had deceased. Lizzie, Lizzie Rolling Hand Fiddler. And she's a descendant to all of them and has relatives on Standing Rock. They use this arrows, grindstones. Um, there's a lot of descendants back there. They're first cousins to all of them, coming from the sisters. And um, it's a long history of Sitting Boo also, who was killed in 1890, December 15th, after the, when the ghost dance was going to be held. That took place after that. So it's kind of a big history and family all together. <laughs> So that's how it, the history of them. So that's why that side of the bunch, the grandmas were on this side. <laughs>